everyone. Welcome to the Tie-Dye Mindset, a podcast for the tie-dye community focusing inside the minds of expert dye artists that have elevated their craft to new heights and are making the world a more colorful place at the same time. My name is Greg Foster, and today's interview, I'm speaking with Carl McClellan, a.k.a. Mr. Tie-Dye. Mr. Tie-Dye is a YouTube sensation, an expert tie-dyer, and an amazing and open teacher of this craft. And I really credit Mr. Tie-Dye to being the person who uh, inspired me through his videos to get in and really learn this craft uh, from the bottom up. And I was really excited to be able to get a chance to talk with Mr. Tie-Dye for about an hour. For my first interview today, it was really important to me to get the mentor that I look up to in Mr. Tie-Dye and really get a chance to understand what goes on in his head when it comes to doing this amazing artwork. Uh, Mr. Tide has graciously consented to this interview to share his extensive knowledge and experience so all you tie dyers can understand, really understand the mindset of the dye artist and what it takes to embrace this craft and spread color around the world. So sit back, I hope you enjoy the interview. You can find Mr. Tide Eye's instructional videos on his YouTube channel, Mr. Tide Eye. He's also on Facebook and Instagram at Mr. Tide Eye. And uh, yeah, like and subscribe the videos if you like what you see leave some comments and let me know uh if there's anything you want to hear or anybody you want me to talk to have a great day guys enjoy all right guys hey greg foster here i am blessed to be in the video presence with us tie-dye carl mcclellan and i am super excited because i get to interview the gentleman who has really through his use of youtube uh, shared with me and many others uh, the basics and the foundations of becoming uh, a decent tie dyer. I'm not a professional or expert in any way. Uh, at least I don't consider myself that way. There are people out there that have been doing this for 30 plus years, and I think they have a lot more insight. And uh, that's why I'm starting this interview series is really to get inside the mind a little bit, maybe not specifically into technique. Um, or their secrets, but really more about the dyer is what, what's going on in their head and, and why they stay with it. So I want to welcome uh, Carl, Mr. Tie-Dye, and um, just welcome, first of all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, share with me a little bit about, you know, how you got into tie-dye, where you come from, a little bit about your background, you know, what, 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 what is Mr. Tie-Dye? <laughs> Well, I got into tie-dye 20 years ago, and it was one of those things, uh, me and my partner at the time, we were starting uh, uh, opening a bookstore, and it also had, you know, candles and crystals and incense and then other handmade gifts, and we were really just looking to add more and more of the handmade gifts just to kind of personalize the store for, for us. And back then, I mean, I had never done tie-dye. I'd seen it. I might have had one tie-dye shirt before I started doing it. But uh, my partner at the time, Karen, she had done tie-dye in the past, and she suggested that. I said, well, let's give it a try. So we bought a small kit from Dharma and broke out some of our T-shirts and dyed them up. And I just loved the process and the results that we got. So we bought a big case of T-shirts and a big kit from tie-dye. And spent a rack fill or a week filling the rack with tie dye, and after that we we opened our book and gift store, and within six months I would say it became a tie dye store. It just people just flocked, just wanting the tie dye. So we got a couple partners, and we'd opened it originally out of our house. Uh, it was called Indigo Child. And then we moved to a location downtown and took on a few partners. And then it became, instead of a bookstore with tie-dye, it became a tie-dye store with some books on the shelf. So we just kind of really expanded the tie-dye. And we had the store in Pendleton for about a year. And then we moved it to La Grande for some personal reasons. And it just didn't do as well there. But I had fallen so much in love with tie-dye that when we closed the store, I kept on doing it. And eventually, me and my partner, we parted ways and I moved out to uh well actually I moved to Pendleton back to Pendleton first I was in La Grande moved back to Pendleton did some more tie-dye there and that's where I actually got my name Mr. Tie-Dye I was tie-dyeing with the school a bunch of first and second graders and they couldn't pronounce my last name which is McClellan 
So all day long, they were saying, Mr. Tie-Dye, can you come help me? Mr. Tie-Dye, I have a question. So by the time I was done with the school, I went and checked and nobody had the name Mr. Tie-Dye. So I claimed it and that's where Mr. Tie-Dye was born was from first and second graders giving me my name. It's the best way and, to get a nickname is from the kids rather than putting it on yourself. That's awesome. Yes. And then from there, I moved out to Salem and started doing tie-dye at the Salem Saturday Market. I started doing more schools and it just kind of expanded from there. And I've just, I've always loved tie-dye since I started doing it. And I just keep on doing it. I keep finding new ways, new things to fold up, new ways of dyeing things. Excellent. It just seems to have endless possibilities. Well, that's cool. So it was kind of a journey of, of customer desire rather than, you know, uh, I'm a deadhead and I'm just walking around and, and I need to make another shirt to get a sandwich. And that's, that's really cool that, that you let the, the customers kind of direct you in that way after a little experiment. That's yes. awesome. So what do you think, uh, did you have any challenges like what you, you were saying the demand was there for it. Were there any challenges as far as uh, what you were producing, styles that you were putting together? Um, you know, what were, what were some of your challenges back then? I think the main challenge was just trying to figure out new designs. Uh, I would meet other tie-dye artists and ask questions and they would just clam up. It was basically, if you want to buy a t-shirt, buy a t-shirt, but otherwise go away. Uh, nobody would talk to me, mm -hmm. you know, when I, meet them in person. So I just did a lot of my own experimentation. Uh, I would make, you know, five or six t-shirts at a time so that I could remember how each one was tied. And I would take, you know, detailed notes of how I folded it, how I dyed it. So that if I liked the results, I could go back and repeat them. So I think that was my main, main problem was just learning how to do different techniques. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think all these years later, I've kind of come full circle. You know, back then I was looking for somebody to teach me and there was just nobody. Uh, so now I am the teacher for people who are just starting out. Yeah, and I tell you, you've certainly done a great job. Your channel, your YouTube channel is, is amazing. Thank um, you. So when you had those challenges of coming up with the designs, how long do you think it would take you to establish, you know, uh, a proficiency at, at, at tie-dye? How long did it really get you to the point where you could confidently fill your store and be, you know, feel proud or good about the, the products that you were putting out there for people? I, I, I think I really kind of took to that quickly. As um, soon as I kind of learned the, the actual techniques, you know, through practicing or, you know, Karen had taught me some stuff from what she knew. But after that it was it just seemed like a simple formula it's like my mind got it and after a while I got where I could look at another tie-dye and kind of see the fold lines and figure the patterns out so I, I kind of just spent just a couple years perfecting things and then you know as I learned something new either through my own experiments or you know every now and then I would find somebody that would dribble a little tip out there for me um, and so I think after just a few years, I was able to really feel confident with what I was doing. And then I would look back at pictures and see that I've grown even more. You know, I, I would look back three or four years and think, wow, I was doing those then. But I just kept improving and it just takes practice. Patience. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> That's the thing for me is I've always been fairly impatient and this, this craft has taught me, yes, you can wait 24 to 48 hours to see the results of your work. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Did you ever have any like mentors or aside, you know, if you were saying Karen gave you some tips here and there, did you have any, anybody that really kind of said, yeah, I'll work with you and, you know, kind of teach you what I know or was, did you figure it all out on your own? Um, I didn't really have a mentor that worked with me seriously, but, uh, when I was on MySpace, I mean, that really dates it, <laughs> uh, back in 2007, 2008, 
uh, really just kind of before I got onto Facebook, I was on MySpace and mm -hmm. I had seen the artists on there and Jeremy St. Rebel, he was one of the ones early on that did give me some, some tips. Uh, I had been experimenting, trying to figure out the peace sign. And I tried it several different ways and just couldn't really get it in the way I wanted it. And he kind of sent me down the right direction. He sent me a little fold up thing that really kind of opened me up on the peace sign. And then it did, I think he would dribble some other tips out there to me uh, just to help me improve my work. Uh, you know, some dye mixing techniques, you know, uh, a little bit of folding stuff. So, I think he was the main one that kind of helped me here and there. And then just over the years of meeting more tie-dye artists on Facebook, you know, you would see somebody else's work and I kind of converse back and forth with them a little bit. And I would get little tips and hints about how to fold this or how to fold that. But most of it, I think I really kind of brought it together myself. So I, I got some hints here and there, and then I worked with those hints through my own practicing and, went up and I think that's the way a lot of people do it. You know, they, they, they just start doing it and then they gather what hints they can. And I think with my, my channel now, it allows more people to get in. If you have success right at the beginning, <clears throat> then it helps people stick with it. I think people, if they try something, sometimes if they have failure, then they just think, Oh, I'm not. Yeah. I think, I, I think I saw you. I thought maybe we're just sitting still. <laughs> Um, yeah, people getting having success in the beginning, I think helps them encourage them to continue on and try more rather than just get one or two bad shirts and decide they're not good at it. Right. right. So hopefully the videos are helping people have that success in the early stages, mm -hmm. or at least enough to encourage them to move forward with it. Well, without having those kind of that kind of almost daily affirmation uh from somebody like yourself what was it that kept you going what what do you think was it that you know a lot of through some of those failures uh a lot of it for me was just just knowing that i could do it i mean i i would see results out there so i knew people were having success at it so for me it was just a matter of pushing myself because i think from the first few shirts that i opened i really just kind of fell in love with the whole process and that each shirt is unique. Even if you sit down and tie up, you know, 25 rainbow spirals, each one of them is gonna be a little bit different. And when I made stuff for my booth, I didn't wanna make, you know, 25 of this spiral and 25 of this scrunch. Or I like to, to mix it up. I mean, yes, I had rainbow spirals scattered throughout my booth and all the sizes, but really what, what drove me was getting the unique t-shirts because that then speaks to a person, mm -hmm. you know, not every shirt speaks to every person, but I think every person will find a shirt if they really want one. I, I couldn't agree with you more. There are shirts that I've made that I look at, and I'm just like, Oh, I don't know if I can <laughs> even sell that. And then it's the first one that goes, people are like, Oh my God, I love that shirt. I'm like, okay, <laughs> here you go. Yes. <laughs> Um, so go ahead. I don't, I don't judge a, a shirt, how it comes out because just because I don't like it doesn't mean somebody else is going to love it. Yeah. I, I, I've definitely learned that lesson. It's kind of like a, a Bob Ross moment. You know, there are no, there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. Exactly. <laughs> um, so you, I mean, you've been tie dyeing for years and years and years and you know, through, through your videos and your channel, I've seen you show us how to do multitudes of different styles, different folds, different patterns, the stitching and all, and all those great uh, practices. Have you, or do you feel that you've come up with like your own specific style, like the Kenny style or the Ron star or any of those that are like signature styles for those artists? Have you, have you gotten anything for yourself? Um, the, the only one that I would say would be the, the quantum scrunch. That's oh, one yeah. that it, I, I don't think I had seen anybody do that. It came from me sitting down and just folding a t-shirt in just odd ways just to see what I could get for it. And this one here is one that actually one of my tie-dye students made and sent to me as a gift yesterday. So that's why I'm wearing this t-shirt today. Uh, Mark Morgan and Tina 
tie-dye on Instagram. They've been following me for a year now and doing tie-dye and they sent me this gift. But, so anyways, yeah, the quantum scrunch would be one that I would consider one of my signature styles. But other than that, I just, I didn't want to stick with just one thing. I like just the variety of being able to create anything. Mm -hmm. And now I think one of my, not really signature styles, but I do a lot of uh, meditating and I get ideas that come to me in my meditations. Mm -hmm. And I love that with tie dye, I can sit down then and bring that vision that I see in my meditation into life by putting it on a t-shirt or a tapestry. Right. right. Um, that kind of segues perfectly into my next question is, uh, you know, I, I, personally, I come from a background of very creative people. My mother was a sculptor and an artist. You know, my parents were both, uh, you know, kids of the 60s. And I was definitely a child of the very early 70s and had longer hair than most uh, throughout my youth and grew up in that kind of uh, environment, that, that hippie culture. And that creativity had always been around me. I, I studied art in school and and always had that sort of creative knack. Uh, I did sculpting and, and dabbled. I barely can even say I dabbled in tie-dye uh, back in high school. Um, but it wasn't until the last few years where it really became serious for me because I just, I, I, I lost a lot of opportunity to exercise that creative gene. Do you feel that, you know, in, in your being that, that, that creative gene is present or is it more of a, I need to share color and, 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 and light and, and things of that nature for you? I think it's a, a mix. I do feel like I have a creative gene. Uh, it doesn't show up in the rest of my family in, in an artsy way. I mean, I think people are creative in many different ways, but as far as, creating art nobody else in my family is doing something like this and even growing up I didn't consider myself a creative person mm -hmm. but I did dabble a lot with uh, I played with clay a lot making little figurines and I discovered photography when I was 13 mm -hmm. and so I took pictures all through my life and that's that was a, a great joy but I, it wasn't until I started doing tie-dye that I really considered myself to be creative and then when I look back over my life I realized that no you've been creative your whole and tie-dye is just the way that really brought it out in me mm -hmm. uh, just so many possibilities with tie-dye that's awesome um so I want to just kind of dive a little bit into your YouTube presence as it's been super influential for me and I know a lot of other people out there as you call us your rainbow warriors which is totally awesome um uh you know what was what was your kind of inspiration with um compiling a list of I mean basically you are an instructional channel uh, you know to to kind of strip it to the bone uh what what kind of inspired you to go from just posting you know, random shots of, you know, your awesome tie-dye labyrinth and that kind of process and, and some other cool videos like the fire eating and, and stuff. What, what led you down the path of, I need to kind of be a, a standard bearer for instructional tie-dye? Uh, that was kind of a, a journey that morphed as I went along with it. Uh, about three years ago, through my meditations, you know, I find myself be a spiritual person. So I meditate a lot and I just felt a, a calling to be of service. And I really didn't know what that looked like for me. And then in one of my meditations after, well, I guess let me back up. So I felt the call to be of service. And then during that same time frame, I had three different people ask me about making videos. And the first two people, I said, no, that, I, don't, I don't do videos because I've always been a, a shy person by nature. And I just couldn't see sitting down in front of a camera and making videos. So I just kind of, I just sloughed it off. But when the third person asked me, then I took that as a sign. You know, when three things happen in a, in a row, I take that as a sign. So when that third person asked, I thought, okay, well, maybe I do need to make some videos. And I initially I thought, well, I will make 
you know, a handful of videos just to kind of put some basics out there. And then I figured I was going to be done with that. Uh, I started my channel, started making videos, but then I started having so much fun with it that I, I just didn't stop. So it just kind of morphed from me wanting to put just some basics out there to deciding that I wanted to continue to teach because there just was more and more interest. Uh, the more videos I put out, the more questions I would get and requests for this pattern or this design. And so I just kept on doing it and going into the live streams. That's been a, another thing that just, it kind of happened one day, you know, we were shut down for the whole COVID thing and I decided, you know, with everybody at home, I wanted to do something to just try to entertain people. So, and I assumed that we would be in shutdown for a short period of time and then we'd be back, you know, trying to open up the, so I thought, well, while we're in shutdown, I'll do these live videos. And now it just, it's gone on and on and the show has kind of morphed and grown. And so I just kind of go with the flow of where I feel pulled and continuing with these videos is, is just where I kind of feel pulled to do or what I feel pulled to do. Awesome. <clears throat> you know, how do you feel that engaging with the people in this way has really uh, affected your uh, perception of the tie dye community? Hmm. I, I really enjoyed it. I get a lot of, a lot of feedback. Uh, almost all of it is positive. Every now and then I get, you know, a negative comment or something. And I just try to push that aside because you can't please everybody. Mm -hmm. I, and like I say, this art has been so secretive. So some of the people that are making negative comments or give me thumbs down, it might be because they would prefer that I not be doing this, but I, I see it as a way to to help people and the feedback that I get, I've heard from people that are just starting out that have been able to improve their skills pretty quickly. And I've heard from people that have been doing it for 20 years that said that they had learned and they sound like they had done tie dye this way for their whole time. They didn't really see other ways mm -hmm. and having my channel available, it's, I hear from people that have been doing it for 20 years and say they have improved their work because of my videos. And that's what really I, I, I love to do is to help people or to inspire people to have success in this art. Well, you've certainly helped and inspired me greatly. <laughs> wow, that's, that's amazing. I, to have people 20 years in the industry or 20 years doing this art form come to you and say just I'm looking at it a different way has helped improve that. I mean, that right there is, is, I mean, kudos enough when you've got experts praising your, your work. Um, so let me, let me ask you this still on, on, on the YouTube. What do you think? Um, well, first of all, let me ask, do you prefer more the live streams or doing the instructional videos where you can kind of clip and edit and get it, into a more polished form, which one do you prefer doing? I like them both, but I, I think that the, the recorded videos are better because I can get into more detail. When I'm doing the, the live stream, you know, it's only whatever comes to me in the moment. You know, mm -hmm. when I sit down and start my live stream, I know what design I'm gonna do, but then after that, I'm just kind of winging it as I go. Well, not winging it, but. <laughs> Uh, I'm just kind of going along with whatever comes to me. But when I'm doing a recorded video, I can start shooting and sometimes I might get an inspiration in the middle of that. So I can pause that, figure out what I want to do next and then start it again. So I do feel like the recorded videos can be more detailed. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I prefer to be. And as soon as I get done with, I have a, this whole stack of custom orders I've been working on and I'm just about to the, the bottom of that. So I want to get back into making more of the recorded videos mm. as well as continue the live video. The live video has been fun in a different way, you know, where I get to interact with the crowd, you know, not one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, I can see their, their chats or ask me questions. I get to answer them. So it's been a lot of fun and that's gone up. I, in the beginning, I had maybe 30 or 40 viewers and now I have up to a hundred viewers mm -hmm. on every Wednesday. So 
the live ones have been a lot of fun, but I do want to get more recorded ones up. Do you think one or the other has a little more impact in the tie dye community, or do you think that they're just so different, different enough vehicles that it's hard to compare the two? Yeah, I, I think they're they're quite different because it, I I see a lot of the same people that come on to the live videos. Now, granted, those ones uh, afterwards people can go in and watch them. Your know, YouTube automatically uploads them, but I think that the the other videos I get more detailed in them and I think people can sit and study those because there are set up like a just a, a lesson for this particular design where the live ones uh, I, I've been I modified it where I do do the tutorial right at the beginning but I still kind of do a little bit of asking you know answering of questions when I can so it's not quite as instructional and the, the live ones also I feel like I I can't do too detailed of a one because I I'm not all the way up in my brain. I'm interacting with this crowd and I've done live ones before and I get distracted and I put wrong colors, wrong places and stuff. So more more things happen in the live videos, which is, is fine. I, I, I love when the universe interacts, but mm -hmm. if I'm gonna teach, I think the recorded ones do a better job of that. They're more concise. I can fast forward through some of the, the detailed, you know, the less detailed parts you know, if I'm squirting dye on, people don't need to see me squirt the whole thing on the shirt at slow speed. So I can fast forward through those moments and just really make it a lesson plan. Yeah, I've definitely uh, felt that anxiety when I'm doing a Facebook Live with for my followers of doing a tie dye and I get to the part of laying the color down and I'm just like, all right, well, I got 50 colors to lay down on this <laughs> lined out shirt, so bear with me and then try to come up with something to talk about for that 10, 15 minutes. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I've been watching some of those live videos. They are a lot of fun, uh, a great way to interact. And, and I, I don't know if you've noticed, I think you have really how your followers have been able through those live feeds to help answer questions and really be a part of your community rather than just observers, which I think is a great way to uh, get people tied in. Um, so kudos, thank you so much. You're welcome. If you were able to go back um, to the beginning of when you started doing your, your videos, is there anything that you would do differently? Anything that you would have changed or, you know, do, are you happy with where you're at? Um, I am happy with where I'm at, but if I could change one thing, it would probably be in the beginning, YouTube only allowed me to upload short videos. I think they had to be under 10 minutes. And there are several videos that were in two or three parts. And I think I would have maybe held off on those until I was able to upload longer videos. And maybe I would have just tried to do more of the all-in-one mm -hmm. videos at the beginning. Because I still, even two and a half years later, I still get people saying, where's part two to this? I can't find <laughs> you, you should put the, the results at the end. It's like, yes, I, I do that now, but that one there was in the beginning. And you know, so that's yeah. the learning curve. I, I really didn't know anything about YouTube. I mean, I've been on it since 2008, but as you can see, there was just a couple little things that I uploaded. Mostly I was just watching stuff. Mm -hmm. and, so now that I, I know more, if I could go back and change that one little thing where I just made all in one videos, I think it makes it less confusing for people. Yeah, well, I see it as a way to see how you've transformed and uh, uh, moved into who you are. You know, it's like, uh, it, it makes you real. <laughs> it makes you a lot more human than just this perfect guy out from the beginning. and. And I appreciate, you know, watching you futz with your camera and being honest about it. I, I haven't used this new camera before. I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> Gives us all a good chuckle, that's for sure. Um, so uh, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, you know, I've heard, I've, I've been watching a lot of tie dyers. I've been asking them a lot of questions out there. Um, uh, and I've heard, you know, kind of we touched on this before we started the, the interview of, 
some tie dyers are very uh, tightly held with the, how they do it, their processes. Um, there are people like yourself that are very open and willing to share technique and, and folding and even, you know, uh, basic dye recipes. Um, you know, I feel that there, there are kind of two camps that are, are not necessarily fighting each other, but are definitely, uh, yeah, let's share everything or let's keep everything secret. We've earned our expertise. Why would we want to share? Um, obviously I can kind of tell which camp you're in. What, again, what kind of got you down one road or the other? Um, for me, I mean, I, I've always tried to teach people. Uh, I think what really set me up perfect to do these videos is the last 16 years I've been teaching in the schools, uh, working with the kids and doing tie-dye home parties. So in one way or another, I have been teaching uh, this art for 16 years. And I, I do feel like art needs to be shared. But at the same time, I do understand the artists that have developed their own techniques over the years that they do want to keep those secret because they don't want to see the market flooded with their special designs if they're making a living off of them or whatever. So I don't want to disparage any of the artists that are not sharing the stuff. I know for me in the beginning, it was frustrating, but the longer that I've been in the community, I, I do understand. And there are some techniques that different artists have developed themselves through many years. So they deserve the right to, to get paid for that, whether it's through the selling of the t-shirts or the selling of a, of a video. And I have bought uh, Josh Shep's Ripple video because that was one design that I really liked. I couldn't figure out how to do it myself. So I supported another artist. And I think that's what more people need to do is support artists, whether you're buying their work or you're buying their lessons or whatever. And this tie-dye community, I think is for the most part like that. I mean, there's some little things that happen here and there. I see it across all the tie-dye pages, but you know, that's gonna happen in whatever genre you're in. I think if you go to a painting class, you know, you might see you know, a painting video site you might see the same thing. You might see the artist is like, oh, quit sharing those secrets. <laughs> you know, you're diluting the market or something. And, but yeah, I'm fully in the, the share everything market for people. I just, I want to see people have success. Mm -hmm. So if, if I, if it's a design that I have figured out myself, then I feel okay sharing it. Although I have had a few people that have requested, you know, don't make a video on this because they do consider it, you know, one that they are making money off of or one that they figured out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, other people can figure it out also, but I'm not going to be the one to, if, if they have requested, you know, contact me personally, I, I honor that and I don't make those videos. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, with any community to really be an icon or, or somebody with any respect, you got to treat those around you with the same kind of respect that you would expect. You know, I, I shelled out for Josh's Ripple video. I think it's an amazing uh, tutorial. Uh, it's taking me <laughs> quite a few shirts to get it down. Um, but it was, I was without a hesi hesitation, I was willing to support what he's doing and his willingness to share a technique that I think many of us in the industry are just in awe of. I think it is visually stunning. So, uh, yes. and I joined your, your membership page for the same reason. It's like, this guy has taught me more than I could possibly imagine. And the least I could do is, is help support, uh, what you're doing. So I, again, you know, it's only a few dollars a month, but at the end of the day, if it helps you, uh, it's great. And probably I will have to up my membership. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate all the support I can get. It of gives course. me time to make more videos. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we did kind of tie on the the uh, the the two camps, and really, um, you know, I think we've talked enough about that. Um, the one thing with you that I've noticed is, is you don't tend to get caught up in ego. 
uh, or, or self-aggrandizement. You've really been focused on uh, your humility and open sharing of this craft, um, which I think is awesome. I try to, you know, be open and, and, and willing as well. Um, do you feel that with your channel and what you're doing for people out there that you may have become some sort of icon or some sort of celebrity, shall we say, in the, in the tie-dye world? Um, it, it does feel like that just because as I go into my different platforms, I, I answer questions, you know, all over the place, you know, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, uh, one or uh, actually three pages on Facebook and my email through my store. So there are some mornings where I sit down and I might answer questions for two or three hours. So that does, you know, tell me that people are coming to me for answers and part of that might be because of my willingness to answer the questions but also if they've seen my work i mean maybe they really know that i might have an answer for them mm -hmm. now sometimes they ask me off the wall questions and it's like i haven't even tried that so i can't even speak to it but if it's something that i know about from my 20 years or i have an impression about it then i will try to answer that so I don't, I, no, I do feel like I have become a little bit of an icon and I look forward to traveling the world someday and maybe getting spotted and like, Mr. Tie-Dye. <laughs> <laughs> well, with your pants and your shirts and your beard, I'm yeah. sure a lot of people will notice. <laughs> and so I think the easy way for me to go incognito is just to wear plain clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Do you think that, uh, that uh, awareness of um, your visibility within the community has affected the way that uh, you present your work or that you uh, do your work or anything like that? Um, I think somewhat. I mean, I, I do try to, I know a, a lot of kids watch my videos, so I do try to present myself as a, you know, upstanding person. You know, I try not to put bit that, I think part of that though is just how I am in my my life, my my spiritual life through my meditations and stuff. I think I've just grown in my my being the best me that I can be. So that also has helped. It's not just how I present myself in the tie dye world; it's how I present myself out in the world. So it just kind of overlaps into this tie dye community because that's where I'm sharing my art at. Right. Well, that's, yeah. It's kind of hard to separate one being from another when, when you're one human. <laughs> yeah. So my common response, that's just how I roll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Got to be able to roll some way, right? Yes. Um, so as an instructor, uh, first of all, let me ask you this. Did you, when you got into tie-dye, did you have that inkling or that intuition that at, at some point you would be teaching, be an instructor, be a mentor for people out there? Or what, you know, how did that kind of uh, get into who you are as, as a tie-dye or, uh, you know, being, being somebody there that people can look to? Um, I, I hadn't really thought about it that way in the beginning. I was just wanting to learn just for myself so that I could create awesome clothes or tapestries. And what really got me into the teaching was, um, I told you that I had started this, the store with Karen. Well, mm -hmm. her son had broke his wrist just before school started and being right-handed, he couldn't write. So I volunteered in the classroom to help him take notes and stuff in class. Well, I always wore a tie-dye shirt because that's just how I am. <laughs> and after three weeks, he didn't need my help anymore, but I could see how overworked the teachers were. So I continued volunteering in the classroom a couple days a week. Once again, I always wore tie-dye. Then towards the end of the year, the teacher asked me if I could teach her students how to do tie-dye. So I set up a little class and I did, you know, I taught the kids and I thought, you know, well, that's the end of it. Well, then when I ended up moving back to Pendleton, um, I was selling some tie dye and I decided, well, let me just put up a sign just in case. So I said, you know, teacher, ask me about school events. 
and I put that sign up on my booth at the, the Friday market. And within, I think, two or three times of me having that sign up, I had a couple teachers ask me about it. And that's where I set up with the school and got my name, Mr. Tie-Dye. Hmm. So then when I moved to Salem, then I did the same thing. I put up a sign and I started getting all of these questions and people asking me, you know, how I could go into their school or how I could go to a birthday party. So initially, I think it, it just started out as just a way to spread a little bit of the tie-dye out there. And also, you know, I was looking for more ways that I could earn a living as a tie-dye artist because I really didn't want to go back to working a regular job. I kind of had many jobs and then I, we started the store and I was able to quit my job for a while and then we closed the store and I had to get another job, you know, so it kind of back and forth, but I really liked that no job. So the schools really kind of started out as, you know, a way that I could, you know, make a little bit more money from tie-dye at top of doing the Saturday markets. And then over the years, it really, I did really fall in love with the teaching of the tie-dye. So I, I continued doing the schools, even though I didn't need to, because I was making money from all my other ventures in tie-dye. The schools became a more of a fun thing to do just because I love working with the kids and sharing this art. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of a natural progression from doing it for yourself and for your store into okay I'm gonna teach these kids and now I'm on YouTube and I'm teaching the world yes <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> um, is there anybody in in tie-dyeing that you you look up to other artists other teachers students I mean who, who would you consider as inspirational um, in the the beginning, the, the first artists that I looked up to when I was on MySpace, uh, Jeremy St. Rebel, Courtney Pollock, and Steve Anderson. Those were, you know, the three top tie-dyers that, that I became aware of that just were producing some fantastic work. And I wanted, you know, so they were kind of my goals to work towards. But now the, the industry has gotten so big, so many artists and you know, there's so many different Facebook pages on tie-dye out there. So, and I belong to almost all of them. So I see them and I don't want to start naming a bunch of names because I don't want to forget anybody, but there are so many artists, whether they have just started doing this a year ago and have just gone light speed right into it, or they have been doing it for, for many, many years. But yes, there, there's just a, a ton of artists out there that are producing some fantastic work. I would, I would concur. Yeah, there is, uh, <laughs> there are some pretty mind boggling pieces out there. Is there any, from any of those, uh, any of those artists, is there a specific technique or a specific fold style that, that you've really kind of just said, Oh my gosh, that that's just amazing. You know, is there like, like the G out or the Kenny or the, you know, the accordion, you know, what is sort of your, your, the one that catches your eye the most? That would be what I, I don't know exactly what it's called, but the, the scrunch pleat. And that's something that uh, Jeremy Rebel, St. Rebel does. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh Shep, he does that. Nathan Riggle does that. Um, Austin, I, I can't think Guys of the last and vibes. Huh? Dies yeah. and good vibes, yeah, Austin. Yes, so yeah, that, that scrunch plate, and it's not something that I have, I've done just a, a tiny bit of it, but because my workspace is so small here, I just work on half of one of these folding tables mm -hmm. in my kitchen. Um, those scrunch plates, they take a bigger space where you can lay, because I envision doing tapestries, mm -hmm. you know, like Nathan Riggle does, but I haven't even practiced the technique that much. Mm -hmm. I did get an opportunity to work the technique a little bit with Jeremy St. Rebel back in 2014. We made a, a steely dragonfly tapestry. Mm -hmm. Of course, he did most of the work, but I at least got in there and was able to see the technique. And it's really fascinated me because for me, doing the detailed designs has always been stitching. Right. Uh, I've done you know, a lot of folded stuff, but as far as the extreme detailed stuff, it's been stitching. 
And now my, my wrists just can't hold up to that. So I've really kind of cut back on how much stitching. So I'm wanting to learn more folding techniques. And that scrunch pleat is the one that I really want to get into when I have a bigger space to work in. Hmm. Yeah, that scrunch pleat, it's, it's captivating. You mentioned the same artist that I, I, I'm just like, wow. Uh, they've taken their time to really, really hone in on that specific design, and I love it. Um, all right, so with tie-dye kind of, you know, I, I've seen tie-dye, I'm, I'm sure you have, moving more from counterculture into the mainstream through, you know, just regular Target fashion or, or Walmart fashion, you can find tie-dye to, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's really everywhere these days. Um, do you feel that that dilutes the art form or do you feel that it, um, you know, has, has affected the, the historical tie-dye community as far as, their own perception of the art what you know what are your thoughts on how it's moving into the mainstream um the the one thing that i would say dilutes it is the the mass produced tie-dye that some of it i i i know is not actual tie-dye some of the stuff that's being sold out there in the stores is screen printed mm -hmm. And you can tell that by just looking in the, the inside of a t-shirt. And sometimes you can actually see the screen marks or you can see that it's lighter on the inside than the outside. Uh, so if anything, I mean, that would be what I would say is diluting the, the market is the fake tie dyes that are out there. Somebody that's just trying to capitalize on a look. Mm -hmm. And what I prefer is, you know, the, the handmade tie dyes. But there's so many artists out there, but the world is a really big place. So part of it, you know, I've been teaching more and more people how to do tie-dye, or they've been learning through my channel and other channels. There, there's lots of channels out there, and that's something that I've enjoyed seeing new people starting channels, mm -hmm. helping more people learn, because, I mean, I can only teach, do so many things. Mm -hmm. So having other people teaching I think is fantastic so I don't think that is diluting the market mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a certain number of people that are going to love it but not everybody is going to love making it some people might want to try it out just for their own experience and then they're going to move on to something different so I, I really don't feel like it's diluting the market I think the fake tie dyes would be the one thing I could not see any more of <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some of the, the, the guys that we've been talking about recently, they've started doing like the printing of a lot of their big tapestry uh, images, which I, I, I don't see it as dilution. I see uh, what they've done as allowing, uh, opening the access to that specific design that they did that obviously took weeks, months, you know, maybe even a year or so to put that tapestry together, to get that into a wearable form, I think. Uh, I commend them at the same time. Uh, uh, but man, I would love to get a, a, a real tie-dye by them. I think it, I, I don't want to say it cheapens their art, but it does a little bit, <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah, uh, when, yeah. I about the, when I was talking about tie-dyes I was more indicating you know I've seen like the rainbow spirals oh yeah yeah that that are, are screen printed and that's but as far as people that are displaying their art from a tapestry on a t-shirt through the dye sublimation process right I, I consider that a whole different level okay uh, that's something that I have worked with a company called the mountain uh, back in from I think 2012 to 2016 they carried several of my designs mm. where the, I would send them a picture of my tie dye and then right. they would dye sublimate it onto t-shirts. I think that's, you know, the same as, you know, the artist that paints a picture and then he makes prints of his right. picture to, right. to sell at a, a lesser price. A limited edition. Yeah. 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 So I, I can see doing that, but in the end, yes, I, I do like a, a handmade tie-dye. piece of a piece. <laughs> um, where do you see, 
the future uh, of tie dye? How do you see, um, or what do you envision the community becoming or the art form becoming uh, five, 10, 20, 30 years from now? That's a little difficult to tell. Um, tie dye just seems like it, it continues to grow and change. You know, I think as new designs, patterns, people are figuring something new out. It, it injects something else, you know, into the tie dye world that all of a sudden now everybody wants to try this pattern and then another new one comes out. And now everybody wants to try this one. And I've seen that with several different designs that somebody perfects something and then it's like everybody wants to do do that one and i just see that there's so many possibilities for tie-dye that i can see that it will just continue to do that more and more people are going to get into it and some people are going to do it just for fun just for their family there's mm -hmm. going to be other people that they're going to get into it because they enjoy making it and then selling it so they can make a living off of it and i feel like now there's even more of a possibility for people to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, through my channel, I've had countless people tell me that because of my channel, they've been able to start either start a business or start a side business where they make a little bit of extra money. Mm -hmm. But some of them have, you know, gone into a full on business, opening a store or something because they have a passion for that. And now they have the skills to back it up to stock their store mm -hmm. and i just think that is fantastic i think anybody that can break away from the the regular nine to five job and make a living doing their passion whether it's tie-dye or anything else because that's that's the other thing i mean i'm doing it through tie-dye uh which way back in the day would have been people say you're you're making your living at doing tie-dye How, how's that even possible well i think anything is possible if you set your mind to it, but you have to go out there and start doing it, whether it's tie dye or it's painting or computer work or, you know, well, I guess lots of people do computer work, but, <laughs> but yeah, there's lots of different ways of making a living off of something that we're passionate about. People just, they're afraid to try it, I think, because they don't want to, to fail or they don't think there's a market for it. And I, for that, I say, if you just start trying just a little bit, just if you just can do it just on the weekend and post some pictures, you know, just to kind of show yourself that, yes, there is an interest in your work. Mm -hmm. And I think people are just going to start moving more into their passions. And tie dye is just one of it for a, a lot of people. Yep. Yep. No, I, I would agree. You know, it's, uh, I've seen the fad come and go uh, as far as mainstream, and it's always been kind of in the background with my with my upbringing, and and I've always loved it visually, and the fact that I've been able to get into it, uh, not in in a small part to you, very large part uh, to your channel, uh, it it does wonderful things for me, and I have been able to monetize it a little bit through my other company, and. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's great. I, I get those comments all the time of, man, you've got so much patience and I can't believe, and, you know, this is amazing and I love your work. And, it, you know, it, it feels good to hear that for sure. Uh, but definitely, uh, uh, yeah, I think I would agree in, in the future really is just, uh, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit. Yes. So and one comment on that, uh, you said you know how do you have the patience well i've been asked that numerous times and i think it's more about passion than patience mm -hmm. if you have passion for something then the patience is just there yeah. agreed agreed yeah I, people ask how can you spend you know two hours doing a pleated spiral i'm like two hours goes by and i don't even notice it <laughs> you're like i have this amazing tied up shirt now i get to dye it Yes. Yeah. There's no, yeah, I, I'll be in the garage for like four or five hours and I'll emerge and it's like dark outside and everybody's asleep and I'm like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> so you've been doing this a long time. You've been, you've been a tie dyer for, for a long time. What would you consider to be some of your toughest 
lessons learned, shall we say? I don't want to say failures, but more more toughest lessons learned. Ah. Well, early on, <laughs> not knowing enough about tie dye, um, one of the things that happened once, uh, Karen said that soda ash is something that breaks up the. Well, I don't want to speak bad. <laughs> There was a time where I, I didn't use soda ash on a bedspread because it was an old, old bedspread. Mm -hmm. If somebody brought it in, they wanted it tie-dyed. And I thought, okay, well, the fibers must be open enough. I don't need to use soda ash on this one. And I dyed up this rainbow spiral, and then almost all of the dye washed out on me. <laughs> washed right out, yeah. <laughs> and, and I just thought, well, there must be something wrong. Well, it wasn't until... I think almost a year later that I was reading something and I read exactly what soda and I realized that no soda ash is what activates the dyes. It's not really about the fabric mm. other than as long as the fabric is cotton or rayon or, you know, natural fiber. But so, yeah, that was one of my little missteps very, very early on in my tie dye career. <laughs> <It's not laughs> if you were listening, ash. use the soda ash. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, but I think the rest of the lessons, they don't stand out so much just because, you know, I, I did take it as a lesson. You know, if I had a, a mishap, um, I guess there was one, one t-shirt that taught me about, uh, there, there's a, a person who's going to love it out there for anything. There was a t-shirt that I called the dog. I was doing an experiment and trying something new and I dyed it up, opened it up and it was just horrible. <laughs> so I thought, well, let me fold this back up and I'll add some more color to it, see if I could fix it. I opened it up and it was even worse. <laughs> but in the early days, I wasn't throwing anything away. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, I put a price tag on it and I put it out there on the rack. And every other t-shirt on the rack turned over two or three times over the period of four or five years. But the dog, it just hung in there with me. That's why I called it the dog. It just, it was just there. It was loyal. Right. <laughs> one day a woman came in and she pulled three t-shirts out and hung them up so that she could step back and look at them. And she took one down. I thought, well, there's the winner. Nope. She put that one away. She took another one down. Nope. She put, and the dog was the only one left. She says, this is the perfect one for me. So I, I never prejudged another t-shirt just because I don't like it. Doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to love it. Yeah. Every, you know, one man's treasure or not, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And then being my own worst critic, I think that was another thing, mm. you know, being too hard on myself and I have way eased up. Um, I, I take the universe as one of my partners. So if something goes wrong other than what I have thought about how this is going to go, then I just take that as the universe has interjected itself onto my tie-dye, so I become more accepting of everything that I do. I don't get stressed out over little mistakes anymore. I mean, it just, and you, you or other people have probably seen me mess up on my video while I'm doing a tutorial, and I just roll with it because there's no sense in getting upset about something like that. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, uh, I get upset about putting color in the wrong place. It might end up turning out pretty cool anyways. Exactly. So, you know, moving on that, on that, uh, kind of vein, what would you consider to be your greatest success in this, in this art form? Well, I think the, the YouTube videos has been one of my successes just because I, I know I have helped so many people, whether it's to improve their skills. I've had other people that come to me said that they had this tragic thing happen in their life and tie-dye was a way that they were able to kind of engage in something other than, you know, take their mind off of that other thing. Uh, some people tell me my voice is meditative, so they'll put me on in the background during the day. But the other success that I really enjoyed was the tie-dye labyrinth that I made. Uh, I did over a hundred panels and I had, I think 18, I have to go back and count. But I think I had 18 people that made a, a tie-dye panel for me to be included within this tie-dye labyrinth. 
that I set up down in California. But that was just kind of a labor of love. I mean, I worked on it for several months and then made the trip down there and set it up. And it just, it was just a joyous feeling to have that done. And then there's been a, a few tapestries that I made with the intention of selling them, but they came out so good that I couldn't part with them. <laughs> so I have the, the flower of life. I got a chakra Buddha and I got the peace sign hand. Mm -hmm. Those are three tapestries that I decided not selling. They were successful enough that I wanted them in my life. So yeah, that, that's those awesome. are my that's best awesome. that I can say. I have that same problem every now and then. That's why I always shy away from tying shirts in my size unless they're a custom order because I know if I like it too much, I'm not going to want to sell it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Carl, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today. Um, I've learned a ton about you and uh, hopefully our, our viewers will get to learn a little bit more about, about you as well and are excited to check out some of your videos on your YouTube channel, Mr. Tie-Dye. Uh, I know from my personal experience, it's been super instructional. It has literally launched me from uh, a complete novice, like no experience, uh, a blank slate into somebody that I, that my friends and family and customers consider to be very proficient. Uh, I still have a lot to learn from you. I still have a lot to learn uh, from myself and from my own inner creativity. And I just really appreciate you being that springboard for so many of us out there. And thank you for taking the time today to, to sit down and talk with me. You're welcome. I am glad to be of help. And like I say, it, it just brings me joy to hear how much I have helped other people. And I do hear, get emails from all around the world. Uh, I use Google Translate a lot to communicate with people because they're speaking to me in their language and contacted me from France or South Africa saying, hey, can you help me with this? And it's just been a great joy for me to be able to help so many people. So, and I appreciate you asking me into this interview. Uh, it's fun to kind of come out from behind the camera a little bit. Most people see me from here down in my hands. <laughs> 